Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Thomas Haub. Unfortunately, I can't see you because the light is uh, too strong. Um, I gave a session here yesterday at the same point in time about how to write a proposal. And by mistake, there was an announcement that this session would be repeated today, which is not the case. We are now having the Innovation Radar pitching event in this room. If you are interested in what I did yesterday, please go to the website. The, the slides are there and the video of my presentation is there as well. So you can get, you can get the full information what I did yesterday anytime and anywhere. Thank you for your understanding and sorry for the mistake uh, in the program. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Okay, all right, okay, you're good. No, 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 what's the pause? It's just hello, yeah? You're, are you awake? Okay, right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Owen O'Neill. I'm working in DG Connect, um, and I'm going to be very much better alignment now of the microphones, I'm sure you will agree. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to the Innovation Radar Prize Finals 2018. Delighted to see so many of you here. Uh, we have an action-packed afternoon of excellence. Believe you me, the stress is really on excellence in front of us here today. And I want to set the scene, uh, first of all, about what we're doing before I give the floor to our fabulous innovators who are going to uh, thrill you this afternoon. So look, uh, Innovation Radar Prize. I want to start with a great innovator from Europe. Anybody recognize him? I'll say that again. Anybody recognize him? Of course you do. Well done, that person who didn't open their mouth down there. It is Pythagoras, okay? And Pythagoras came, to, came into my mind when I was trying to get ready for this thing here today. Because Path Pythagoras, uh, those of you, in fact all of you, if not, well, most at least, will recall his famous triangle. Because it's this triangle that came to my attention when I was th thinking this through, th through today. The, because it's famous for the numbers three and four and five. Because there were some things that were three and were four and were five that I was thinking about in preparation for the session today. So, uh, drawing inspiration from our famous Greek innovator, Pythagoras, let's get moving here with, first of all, number three. The number three I had in mind was actually three verbs. And these three verbs relate to innovation radar and, and in effect capture, very simply, but very efficiently, what innovation radar is about. And the first of those three is identifying. The verb to identify. Innovation Radar is about identifying excellence, innovative excellence in Horizon 2020. Be that innovations that have great potential for the marketplace and the great innovators, the great beneficiaries to use our bureaucratic label behind those innovations. Second verb is championing. And that's what this is all about here today, the Innovation Radar Prize uh, finals. Having identified that excellence, let's champion it. Let's put them up there in front of the community. Future role models, things to aspire to, to inspire us as well to do better stuff. And the third verb is supporting. Innovation Radar is not just about identifying and championing, but also supporting the great innovators coming out of our project, helping them with those difficult steps from the laboratory towards or ideally even into the marketplace where impact can really be delivered in terms of economical benefits, societal benefits, or all of the above. And, and we're doing so, I'll come back to these actually individually in a few moments. But identifying, not only are we identifying, we're also having identified, we're sharing who these great innovators are, what their innovations are through the Innovation Radar platform that can be browsed in your browser or via the smartphone apps on the major uh, smartphone app uh, platforms that they have out there. Uh, supporting. This is just two examples. The Irsus and Maryland support actions that are delivering services to innovators to help them on that journey from the laboratory to the marketplace, be it in terms of investor readiness training, mentoring, 
IPO advice, helping develop a business model, intro making introductions to strategic partners, expanding to new markets, or just finding the first customer for a new prototype or service or technology that has come out of their EU-funded project. But they're not the only guys in town, Irsus in Maryland. There's plenty of stuff that is being offered, both funded by the EU and beyond the EU programs to, uh, to, to get these great innovations uh, into the marketplace. Uh, Irsus and Merlin, if you are interested in learning more about their services, they are in the Innovation Village. They're on the Innovation Radar stand on this very floor. Championing. That's why we're here today. To champion the excellence that we have found in this program in the last year. But who will? Who, who will? Uh, how? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. How? How will the winners be chosen today? And this brings me back to Pythagoras. Back to this time, the number four. Because I'm delighted to have uh, uh, the mechanism for choice, for choosing the winners, also known as the jury. I'd like to introduce you quickly here now. We have Teresa Cuna from Portugal. Round of applause for her. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Teresa is uh, uh, um, working with uh, venture capitalists and in the startup ecosystem as is uh, an entrepreneur herself. Next up, Pia Ekinemo from Finland. Yeah. Pia is very active in the Finnish ecosystem. She just flew in today, having been at, at uh, uh, Slush in Finland, and is chairman of the board of, remind me, remind me, Finn, Finnish Business Angels, among many other illustrious roles that she does hold. Thais Powell from Switzerland, our Dutch national, but based in Switzerland, from Heads Capital, <laughs> Venture Capital. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, it's just in alphabetical order on surname. We have Tatiana Zabasu from Croatia. Not Croatia. You're not from Croatia. No. That's a mistake. It's Slovenia, the glorious country of Slovenia. Uh, she was a partner in the, remind me the name of the company again. This is South, Central Ventures. South Central Ventures VC. At least I got, sort of got it right. They have an office in Croatia. So ladies and gentlemen, our fabulous jury uh, who will be making the selection today. Um, this, so look, yeah, back to Pythagoras. Final number from the brilliant triangle, five. And what we're talking about here are the five prize categories that are up for grabs. We have, and these are the order that the pitches will be delivered today. There are four finalists in each of these categories, 20 in total, that between now and 6 o'clock will be delivering their pitch here. Excellent science, best young SME, best early stage innovation, industrial and enabling technology, and tech for society. There, will be a there are four finalists in each. How do they get here? After a public vote, we had 10 in each category, public vote open for two weeks in the first half of November, and that yielded the top four in each category in terms of votes cast, and they are with us here today. Uh, there will be one winner in each category, and then, as is a little bonus, we have an additional number, nothing to do with Pythagoras, and that being one rather important number, and because we have one overall Grand Prix winner that will be decided by the jury based on the pitches hit received today. Now, when, was this, when will the winners be revealed? This year's finalists, oh yeah, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm getting carried away, I'm sorry. No, this year's finalists, who are they? I'm not gonna go through them. We have a brilliant mix from across the program, from the Marish Kladosha Curie action, all the way through all of the uh, instruments and themes under Horizon 2020. We have them from every corner of Europe. Uh, I'm delighted as well that 25% of the finalists come from, well, as we know, the EU 13, the member states that joined after 2000, uh, 2004. Uh, we have, uh, as you will see, an excellent spread of organizations, SMEs, universities, spin offs, startups, and on all sorts of different uh, topics, themes, areas, and uh, facing various exciting business opportunities. Uh, yep, the winners will be announced tomorrow by Commissioner Gabriel and Minister Nofer uh, tomorrow at 1 o'clock in the, in the plenary room uh, in a special award ceremony. And I think, let's see, what do we have? Yeah, yeah. How about last year's winners? Delighted that we have five of them across in the village, in the innovation village on this floor. Don't hesitate to go and talk to them. We have Leanex Scale, CAA Leti, ATC from Greece, Greece with their tr Truth Nest application, Bitalino from Portugal, and Aerox from Spain. Aerox uh, is a spin off of Catec. Catec being the overall winner last year with their industrial drone technology. Go and meet them. They're here obviously today and obviously tomorrow. 
So, uh, look, I think um, without further ado, we should get into the pitching. And uh, just a quick question, do we have the clock sorted, Miguel? No, no, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to, uh, uh, or just, the, we're going to organize a clock during the three minutes for the pitchers uh, when they're pitching. So listen, ladies and gentlemen, let's have the pitches. We're starting with excellent science. And if I'm not mistaken, we should have Avanti Cell Science. Are you here? Yes. Haha. <laughs> Phew, those are very silent. Thank you. Sir. Brilliant. Please, the floor is all yours. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Colin Wilde. I am CEO of Avanticell Science. And today I'd like to tell you about our company's participation in the Marie Skodowska Curie project, Pandora. Avan Thank you. Avanticell's mission is to make cell-based analysis easier and better. Cell-based cell -based testing uses living cells in cell culture to report the biological impact of a wide range of materials. Industry's use of cell-based testing is valued at $2.4 billion per annum and is increasing at 10% year on year. But this technology is inefficient. Two in every three candidate drugs fails in late stage development because preclinical testing has not identified the best candidates. The same applies uh, in the case of nanotoxicity testing, beca often because the cells being used are older than the person using them. Avanticell's solution is to use human cells in primary culture that remember the tissue they came from and to apply specialist skills in cell culture, bioprinting and cell cryopreservation in order to deliver analytical value in an easy to use format. In the Pandora project, our early stage researcher, Alessandro Pernelli, has applied this approach to human immune cells sourced from ethically prepared blood to measure the biological impact of industrial and environmental nanomaterials. Alessandra and her supervisor, Marianne Hewart, are in the audience today and will be happy to answer your questions. In Pandora, Alessandra invented methods that allowed those immune cells to be frozen in industry-friendly plates and then recovered efficiently into culture without loss of analytical value. This Allowed the, uh, allows analytical testing without need for expensive, difficult cell handling. And therefore, uh, Avanticell has protected this technology, which is unique, as a trade secret and with a trademark, cryotics. Pandora's immune cell models have application far beyond the field of nanotoxicity testing. These plug-and-play cell models have application uh, across a wide range of industry sectors and, make, and makes high-value cell-based testing available to non-specialist users. Commercial interest has already been expressed and the first sale of Avanticell products has been secured. As a result, Avanticell is now seeking follow-on investment in order to allow the scalable manufacture of these innovative human, human cell models. We thank IRSIS for the nomination today. We pay tribute to our Pandora partners for advice and inspiration, and we express our admiration in Alessandra and our other predominantly female Avanticell team. Thank you for your attention. Excellent, and bang on time. Please, please, do stay there, because the jury is going to pepper you with the odd question. Can I con 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 
compliment you on your respecting of the time. This is very helpful, we, okay? Jury, any questions? Please, Pia. Hello, thank Hello. you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Start very easy. So, uh, first of all, uh, there has there already been an established uh, legal entity or a year company, Avanticel, and who are, if you don't men mention the name, so names per se, but what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of uh, organizations are your first customers? Uh, our company is, uh, is an established SME. Forgive me, I did not catch the second half of your question. And who are the first customers? You don't oh. need to say the oh. name, but just ah. like uh, give, an, give an idea. No. Our, the first customers for this technology are contract research organizations who are delivering this type of cell-based analysis to industry sectors, ph the pharmaceutical industry and others besides, including the natural therapeutic industry, which we have a particular uh, uh, involvement in. So it is contract research use. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what's your differentiating uh, differentiation because there's quite a lot of uh, cell analysis and uh, you mentioned also organoids in the first slide. I don't think these are organoids from what I see here. Could you elaborate a little bit about your differentiation regarding mm -hmm. are there cell-based uh, analysis? Mm -hmm. The differentiating factors are the use of human cells and the bioprinting of those human cells into 3D models within multi-well culture plates, which is un a highly unusual technique. Cryopreservation of those cells in situ, ready for use, is unique. There is no uh, such product in the marketplace at the present time. And this enables the plug and play convenience of these cell models, which traditionally have been uh, not taken up uh, well by industry because they are difficult to assemble, expensive, and, uh, and very time consuming. You're not doing anything on the organoids then? Uh, because in the first slide you had some organoids. Uh, yes, we do make organoids. Our, our remit I think today was to speak about Pandora and immune cells, but we make organoids from, from a number of different tissues, including healthy and diseased tissues. And that is work that has been conducted with support under the SME instrument phase two program. Could you say a little bit more about the barrier to entry for your competitors to copy what you're doing or try to do the same thing? Mm. One of the barriers to entry is the, uh, the ability to source uh, human tissue with ethical permission in order to build these, uh, these, these cell isolates and then cell models. Uh, we are an established company and we are able to source tissues from individual specific types of, of human donor, which come to us as surgical excess, as I say, with ethical permission. And that allows us to build models which may reflect healthy tissue or diseased tissue in a particular state of that disease. The differenti differentiating factor, we believe, in our technology is the cryopreservation technology. The recovery of cells that are anchored in a multi-well culture plate is typically very poor we have managed to increase it to close to 100%, and that allows the analytical performance of those cells to be retained and for them to deliver high-value high predictive cell-based analysis in a, uh, a cell model which requires no expert handling. And how efficient are the competitors at storing at the moment? So you say you are close to 100% retention of quality of mm -hmm. the cells. Uh, I'm not sure that I can answer your question because there are no comparable models uh, available in the marketplace. The only example uh, uses, uh, from a, a German company of some years ago, uses cell lines, aged cell lines that have been a long time in culture, and that is not physiologically relevant. And our, our, uh, our submission is that using cells that remember that tissue they came from is critically important if one is going to obtain the predictive value that one needs in cell-based analysis. Thank you. Thank you. And just what's your, what's your plan with respect to commercializing this? You said this has your first uh, commercial phase. 
interpret what's the what's the way forward? Um, is there like anything that you need to have done before you can actually start commercializing with it? Uh, one of the challenges is to scale up the manufacturing of this product, and uh, that is w the reason why we're seeking investment. But uh, as I hope I inferred, this technology is a platform technology and is applicable to other cell types in our repertoire and indeed in other people's repertoire. And the critical factor is that it removes that barrier to uh, use of three-dimensional cell culture, which traditionally has been a problem for industry because the of the investment in time and expertise needed to realize such, such models. All right, a round of applause, please, for Avanti <laughs> Cell Science from Scotland. Well done. Thank you. Now, next up in this category, excellent science, we have Fresnel University Institute, Aix Marseille Université. The floor is all yours. You've got your three minute countdown in front of you there. And we'll have the slides, please, for the second pitch. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Stéphane Enoch, Stéphane Enoch, if you prefer. So um, I'm glad to share with you our innovation. Please take few seconds to imagine a world in which medical imaging is so much improved that we are able to provide early diagnosis of disease such as Alzheimer or cancer. Our technology is basically an antenna technology based on metamaterials that will uh, help us to improve MRI imaging in hospitals of the entire body. Oh, can I change the slide? The, gr the green button. Nothing happened. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. 30, um, okay. 30 years hospitals in Europe are equipped with one of the most powerful existing clinical MRI system, ultra high field MRI. But they can use only a fraction of the full potential of this equipment because of physics constraints. Indeed, some parts of medical images appear completely dark, let's say turned dark. Why? There is a bottleneck due to the inhomogeneity of radiofrequency waves that are used to excite and reach the magnetic moment of the body. Of course, any, oh, sorry. Any, any solution should guarantee that we will uh, limit the, the, the energy, the radiofrequency energy absorbed by the body for the safety of the patient. So we have to turn on this image to find a solution to use 100% of, of the full potential of, of ultra high field MRI. To solve this problem, we need several disciplines. MRI physicists, medical doctors, it's really unpredictable. So, uh, medical doctors and uh, researchers working on metamaterials. With our colleagues, we propose to use metamaterials inside antenna. Metamaterials are these composite materials with exotic properties that are known to provide an extreme control on electromagnetic wave, waves. Sorry. After two years of research, six prototypes, and three patents, we can confirm that our new technology enables us to control electromagnetic field in the body and to obtain better MRI image. Of course, we guarantee the safety to the patient. It makes our innovation a unique solution. Our disruptive technology will increase the market of ultra high field MRI in hospitals. In but, but moreover, it will allow us to uh, obtain better images with lower field MRI system. The overall market of MRI is about 50,000 MRI units in the world. MRI antenna market represents 1.5 billion euros, and a single ultra high field antenna costs about 300k euros and could cost up to 1 million. Our objective is to develop world leading European companies to serve this market. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you very much. Stay there, please, please. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Please, jury, the floor is all yours. Questions? 
so your innovation is in the use of different materials than your competitors are using, or? So, the, the, the idea, the basic idea of the invention is just to use metamaterials to have homogeneous field, electromagnetic field in the body, and uh, with the objective to, to remove, remove completely the, sorry, if I cannot show the, the picture, to remove completely the dark zones that we can see somewhere. There. And with the laser pointer, maybe? No way. There. Easy. Okay. okay. We have this dark zone there. And, and the and objective is to remove this dark zone. I didn't quite get where exactly you are in this uh, process of developing this. Is this already ready to be commercialized or is it just being. Okay. Uh, up to now, we have, as I said, it's three patents. Two of them are, are already licensed. And uh, well, there will be a pitch by a company that has the license <laughs> just after the, my pitch. I missed the link with the Alzheimer. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on this? Yep. Yeah, in fact, the, the, the point with ultra high field MRI is that you have a very precise imaging that you cannot have with conventional MRI systems. And because of that, you are able to see disease and to, to, to have early diagnosis of disease such as Alzheimer much before any solution we have uh, at hand now. Do you have early evidence already of that uh, being used for Alzheimer? Yeah, yeah, sure. There are, there are medical proof for that. But that, that are done for by people that are outside uh, our consortium. That's already known. Also, maybe a comment because you say better, it's, I think it's the next slide, you have better, better image and uh, safer and uh, it's uh, yeah. how better I mean maybe quantify a little bit and uh, safer I also I'm not getting <laughs> what yeah. you mean with safer Be uh, so better just means that we can see the whole body without uh, these dark zones uh, th that's what means better okay mm. and then safer is just that if you want to use it on uh, human patients you have to guarantee that you will not have hot points because of the radio frequency wave. And to guarantee that, it, well, there are other solutions that have, such as parallel transmit, but you cannot guarantee the safety. In our case, because the system is sing a single channel solution, which means that we have only one excitation, we can guarantee the safety of the patient. So that's the answer. But I can develop much more, but it will take hours. <laughs> okay, so let, I, let me take it then to the user side, which is a uh, medical doctor. Yeah. So uh, nowadays you project, you use VR for, uh, for surgery planning, and then the VR uh, software can take the imaging for M or MRI or any other sources, basically. So uh, when you project that in a, uh, in a tree, uh, virtual, uh, virtual environment, uh, you can get the, um, the data you know, like linearly or, or like a, not only based on one MRI, but multiple. So you could build a 3D or 4D uh, depending on. So uh, what is the benefit out of, you know, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, um, uh, operate for the operating doctor? Yeah. of having still this kind of a 2D imaging? Or are you planning to also provide this information uh, in, uh, in VR, uh, 3D, yeah. 4D for surgery planning? Yeah, yeah. For, from, well, that's very important. From the, the doctor point of view, from the medical doctor point of view, what they want to do is just to have a very simple system where they have to, well, let's say to, uh, to put the, the patient and have accurate images. And that's a, a priori the only solution up to now to do that with this ultra high field MRI system. Just because we, nothing should be adjusted to the patient. While if you look for other solu existing solution, you have to adjust the system to the patient. Is it uh, the answer to the question? I am not sure that I have catch your question. No, I'm only, I mean, I understand that, but, but like the, the end result is that in yet another 2D, 2D picture yeah. to interpret it. So, yeah, so uh, the added value, you know, of those black areas as such, you get it when you, when you use the same data in 3D 
So I'm a bit questioning of what is the true added value as you can you can already with the current existing existing uh, equipments in the medical hospitals or, or university hospitals making demanding surgery, um, they can already use uh, that yes, quality. Of, of course, of course. Because when, when you do it in 3M, I mean, nowadays the surgeons are using VR for planning their, planning their uh, surgery. So, so if, I, if I can reformulate your question, what is the added value of ultra high field MRI? Is it that? Because it, it, at the end, is that the... Of course. Of course, but, but early diagnosis of the disease such as Alzheimer cannot be done with this equipment. Only ultra high field MRI can do that. That's the answer to your question. But ultra high field MRI cannot, well, uh, as you can see there, oops, so that before, ultra high field MRI is, is not able to provide, let's say, 100% accurate images in all the configurations. And that's what we want to solve in order to be able to use ultra-high field MRI in medical context, to be able then to, uh, to, to, to have diagnosis of disease such as Alzheimer's. In fact, the bottleneck of, that, that's the point, the bottleneck of, of ultra-high field MRI is this problem of inhomogeneity. If we can solve this, we can benefit from all the, the, the potential of this technique. Any more questions from the jury? No? Okay, well, once again, thank you very much. University of Aït <laughs> Marseille. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, third pitch from Technical University of Denmark. The three minutes is yours. You've got the clock over there. Thank you. Let me see green bottom here. Good afternoon. My name is Anders Christensen. I'm a professor at the Technical University of Denmark. I'm here together with uh, Xiaolong Su, Bo Svar Hansen, and Henrik Benze Petersen to present uh, Delight, the world's thinnest eyeglass lenses. Uh, this is, uh, we, <coughs> we will uh, commercialize uh, an uh, ultra high resolution laser printing technology. Uh, this is the result of the ongoing FedOpen project, Chromavision, and we have also received funding from the uh, FED Innovation Launchpad uh, program for these early innovation uh, activities that we have. Eyeglasses with high power lenses are inconvenient. Even in low, lower power, they may also be conceived inconvenient. As a second point of inconveniency, uh, the, uh, it's also that you will have to wait up to several weeks to receive your new eyeglasses when you go to the optician store. We will uh, remove those pains. We will introduce the world's thinnest eyeglass lenses to the market, only half a millimeter thick. And we will laser print them in the optician shop while you wait. Thanks to our innovation to laser print the lenses as nanostructures in a thin film, which is embedded in the layered structures of the existing eyeglass lenses that you have today. And we will uh, offer you all this at the same price as you pay today. <coughs> Xiaolong Su and myself are inventors of the technology. And to commercialize uh, uh, this, we have uh, teamed up with uh, Boswar Hansen and Henrik Bente Petersen. Boswar Hansen uh, uh, has a strong experience as a uh, uh, CEO of a successful university spin out. And Henrik Benze Petersen is an optician with a deep knowledge of the market that we want to enter. He has worked several years at, uh, at, at executive level in the, in the business and he is also a serial entrepreneur in this market. The market for uh, uh, prescription uh, lenses uh, is well consolidated and governed by a few large players. They operate business to business and with uh, very attractive gross markets of 90%. The uh, uh, retail market is more fragmented and they operate with gross margins up to 70% on the lenses. Um, the uh, large lens manufacturers may not be highly motivated to drive the disruption that we suggest, so uh, we have decided for a strategy to drive it ourselves. Three minutes. Yes, please, please. Uh, 
All right, okay. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, we will do this by uh, uh, laser print a prototype, uh, which is a pair of uh, reading glasses, prescription glasses for, for me. And we'll use this prototype to, uh, 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 to validate the technology and, uh, and specify our product. And then we'll introduce it in the market by opening our own uh, uh, high-end optician stores. And then for further uh, uh, market exp expansion, uh, we, will, uh, we see three uh, scenarios, either for sales or joint venture with one of the lens manufacturers, with an existing retail chain, or with a new player in the retail market. With this, I will say thank you for the attention, and uh, uh, we will be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Anders. Okay. Jury, some quick fire questions, please, for Anders. How far are you with the prototype? Right now, we can uh, we can make a three mil we can laser print three millimeter lenses, and then our, uh, we have uh, uh, also national proof of concept funding to uh, make a five millimeter or fifth, yeah, five centimeter, 50 millimeter lenses, which can fit into frames in order to build this uh, prototype. And what, what are the main uh, roadblocks for you to start doing these bigger lenses? Sorry? What are your roadblocks to do a bigger prototype? Uh, this, uh, the, the, ro the roadblock is, is, uh, is the, we are, we are, we are developing uh, the, uh, uh, laser, the, the laser printing machine to write over a larger area. Yeah. What's your margin? Because you're selling at the same price. What's yeah. your margin right now? Uh, What's the, the margin you have on the cost, for, presuming you have the same, same sales yeah. price, what's yeah. your anticipated margin? Yeah. So, so, uh, so uh, the margin we, we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, go for is to go for the 90% in, in the model where we where we, where we have the full value chain. Um, does this, um, I mean, um, how could you enhance this? In a, is there any sustainability angle in this? Can one do something with the existing glasses already? Or like, like that, can you, can, are you reusing the material? Or what is kind of the ecological footprint of, starting to do these kind of lenses as opposed to the current current one I so mean is there a, is there an angle yeah, for yeah, a planet well, I would say that what we are doing I mean uh, in the t in the technology instead of using more material because right now you make the refraction by changing the thickness of, of your uh, of your lens material and we are we are putting that function into 100 nanometer 100 nanometer layer of material which we are which we are able to modify with our our uh, laser printing technology. So you could say sustainability. We use less material. Otherwise, it's it's a, it's it's something which we are uh, putting into the existing uh, uh, stack of uh, like like you do like you make uh, eyeglass lenses today with the uh, end reflection and and hard coatings and stuff like that. Our we 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 just add a thin layer of material in the inside that. Uh, buried inside, protected inside that stack. And thereby we can reduce the size to, I mean, of the lenses, of our lenses, they'll be the same thickness as if you go and buy a pair of non-prescription sunglasses. Okay, this is currently within the university. Is there a, an entity? Yes, this was, uh, this was started as a, as a, as a, as a research project uh, where we actually started developing this technology also f uh, to make colors, to make ink-free colors. But then we, we, we actually have uh, changed our focus to make uh, optical elements, simply because if you look at color decoration, you already got a cheap uh, and efficient solution, so it was very difficult to find uh, users for that. So that's why we, have we, uh, we, we, we switched into uh, to, to, uh, this solution here, where, where you also have uh, some attractive gross margins. Quick question: The IP is uh, from the company, or right now, right now, this the IP is owned by the Technical University of Denmark, yeah. and uh, uh, sorry. Is there an entity or not? We are. I mean, uh, uh, 
right now we are, we are running this as, as an early innovation uh, activity at DTU with external uh, uh, collaborators uh, and uh, with, with the objective to, uh, to launch uh, a, a university spin out during 2019. Any more questions from the jury? Tess. Last one, how would it work if an investor would come on board with the university and uh, with your spin out? Sorry. How would it work if an investor joins? Uh, the university needs to retain certain percentage, or yeah. I mean, at, it's at DTU we have a we, we, we have a well established model for for doing uh, uh, for, for for spinning out, and normally, what you do is 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 uh, on uh, licen licensing agreements, or you or the the uh, 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 company uh, would buy uh, or, or take over uh, the IP. Thank you. Okay, Anders, once again, round of applause for Anders from the Technical University of Denmark. <laughs> and the fourth finalist, University of Zagreb for the excellent science. The floor is all yours. Thank you. All right. You got your clock there. Okay, got it. Uh, hello, my name is Martin Beck. I come from H2 Robotics, which is a spin off from a University of Zagreb, concretely, a laboratory for underwater robotics. So uh, what is H2O Robotics? H2O Robotics is a spin-off company founded a year ago uh, at the laboratory with the sole mission of commercializing results of base research that is done at the laboratory with the purpose of that research not dying off but rather being commercially used and uh, given out to the industry and the market uh, as a means of exploitation. Laboratory consists of something like 15, 20 scientists who for the last 15 years have been leading the laboratory as uh, the main uh, underwater and uh, surface water robotics and research facility in our part of the Europe. And uh, for several years, the plan was to somehow make use of all that research. First product that we commercialized through the company. First product that we commercialized through the company is what you see on uh, the screen. It's exactly what it looks like. It's a water Roomba. Uh, so it's a very small surface vehicle for uh, various purposes. Uh, it started out actually as a student project, but uh, over the course of eight years since the first uh, prototype. It was realized through the university and all other partners in different EU projects that the vehicle is actually a very good idea in comparison to the competing market uh, products because of its very small size, extremely high portability, and very advanced algorithms which are used to navigate it. In comparison to existing products in the market, it can fit in a car, it's one man, one man deployable, it's meant to be very easy to configure, reconfigure, and modify for very different uh, purposes. Sorry. Uh, so there are three main characteristics. It's modular, anyone with a, any kind of technical background can repurpose it uh, if it has needed parts. It's scalable, so one part of these smart algorithms allows multiple vehicles to convey a single mission together, for example, covering a larger area. And it also supports open source. So, for example, researchers can use the vehicle to, uh, as a platform for their own research, which has proven as a very interesting thing to different uh, entities throughout Europe. Um, I'll just quickly go through some basic uh, use cases. Uh, first and foremost is inspection and monitoring. So for both surface and underwater, uh, where we use it either in industry or archaeology, mapping, uh, instead of using big boats and also using it as a AUV or diver tracking. Imagine it like a water satellite for real-time communication with underwater agents. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, University of Zagreb. Thank you. Thank you. Jury, the floor is all yours. I think you said that this is the only um, 
platform this kind in Europe? Are there any competitors elsewhere or yeah, like yeah, something no, that's... There, there are, so there are other USVs, uh, unmanned surface vehicles in Europe, of course, is everywhere in the world, but they usually come pretty big. They're not meant to be uh, one man portable or easily deployable. They're more often like an autonomous boat. Uh, idea behind this was to make it as small as possible. And you said that the company was set up in, uh, with the purpose of commercializing this. Who are your clients? Who are you targeting first? So we started out with clients that were actually originally partners or clients of the laboratory itself. Because the vehicle has been used in a number of different EU projects, like this uh, listed there, with uh, clients and partners from both uh, university space and industrial market space. Uh, so we started out with those and are spreading out to the commercial space. So far, the most uh, acceptable, accepting uh, audience have been uh, mapping and surveying uh, companies because they see the biggest value in reducing their costs. How many of these sweet little things they already have been produced? Uh, 20, and we do them in a manufacturer at uh, our uh, offices in Varvet. What's the price point? Sorry? What's the price point? Uh, the price point is around 15 to 20,000 euros uh, for the base vehicle. And then it can go six, seven times up depending on the equipment needed. Because we also have partners that uh, supply us with uh, different equipment. So, for example, if someone needs mapping of subsea level, like be below sand, then they need a uh, multi-imaging sonar that's like 100k. But base vehicle is around 20. That's what it is. And uh, as as the lot size is not that big, so what is the antici anticipated price point when you think that kind of a, a scuba divers, for uh, especially for leisure purposes, would you see any use case for kind of a um, yes. domain which would come closer to the consumer. Yes, uh, so that use case is actually the most interesting in the whole space. The mapping and serving is pretty boring space, uh, but most, most receiving and uh, most money rich. But uh, the diver communication system, even though it's very useful and it really works, so it allows the diver underwater to basically use Google Maps because we also supply our own manufactured underwater housing for a tablet. So he can communicate with the surface, he can change his mission, or someone else can change his mission. Uh, problem is exactly this price point. So uh, we are working on reducing the price point to below 10,000 euros for the base vehicle. And we are currently in negotiations about opening a small factory in China to reduce the cost, because our biggest costs are the fact that we're doing it in Europe. <laughs> Any more questions from the jury? No, excellent. Well, listen, once again, round of applause, please, for the University of Zagreb. <laughs> now, that brings us to the end of the uh, excellent science category. And now we're going to go from, we've gone from one end from the scientific-driven innovation category of this prize scheme. And now we go to the other end, the best young SME, the market-facing actors with youth on their side. We have uh, four finalists uh, for this. Um, unfortunately, one of them, due to some personal uh, reasons, had to, could not come at the very last moment we only heard this morning. That's Energica from Italy. So we have three remaining competitors uh, for this. So uh, without further ado, could I have Innocence for, to take the floor? We left the slides for Innocence, which would be number six, presentation slide number six from the deck for our technical. So the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, can you just tell me how you are uh, sitting, sir? Yes, uh, forward and back. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hello, I'm Maya. I'm from Innocence. This is a small consultancy based in Serbia, in Onitsat, Serbia, and I'm here to present Gates, which is an innovative um, and amazing uh, training platform for uh, uh, training professionals in smart farming. Um, why smart farming? This coin. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It doesn't work. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay. 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 Sorry about this, guys.
I, I could it, I wait? Does this make sense? We got it. Okay. I'll start it back again. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Hello again. Uh, I'm Maya from Unisys, small consultancy based in Serbia, and I'm here to present Gate, which is an innovative training, uh, training platform for aimed at uh, professionals in the smart farming industry. Uh, why smart farming? Because it helps farmers, uh, why far smart farming technologies? Because uh, they help uh, farmers do uh, more with less. Uh, this is why um, our approach with Gates, our logic behind Gates, uh, is uh, fully customer driven, customer oriented, both customer and end user oriented. Uh, we are agile in our approach and, um, uh, and we are um, uh, on top of this uh, agility. Uh, we are also harnessed by science uh, as uh, complex technologies require uh, complex models uh, to be applied in order for these technologies to realize their full potential. And on top of this, uh, Gates is an overall attractive, it's playable because um, if farmers like to play, users like to play uh, our entire stake, uh, our entire value uh, stake, our entire uh, value chain uh, likes to play and uh, learning, uh, uh, learning through playing to play has uh, proven to be uh, the best uh, approach. Uh, the problem, uh, the, the, the problem, these problems are actually underlying uh, for our entire uh, value chain. Uh, they're related to finance in terms of costs and um, costs and revenues. They're rela related to um, uh, seeking new collaboration uh, opportunities throughout the value chain. And they're related to, um, and the third problem is related to um, actually uh, realizing uh, what smart farming technologies actually can do. Uh, our solution uh, is a serious, uh, is a serious, uh, is a platform uh, which applies um, a, a serious gaming cards concept in order to train uh, smart farming um, uh, prof professionals in the smart farming uh, industry. Uh, it's playable, it's applicable, uh, it's content rich, yet, uh, yet uh, nevertheless, it's uh, also um, enjoyable and it's immersive. Uh, for um, uh, both end users and uh, customers. This means uh, farmers, uh, students, agricultural students, consultants, uh, smart farming technology providers, uh, and so on. Um, Gates is all about the process. Uh, it's not about the product. It's about the process that we apply in order to bring uh, smart the, 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 the true potential of uh, smart farming technologies to the, uh, to the entire uh, value chain. Um, we combine uh, we combine uh, uh, serious and complex uh, scientific models. We combine gaming approach and uh, business expertise brought in by uh, our uh, network of partners, five partners uh, in uh, Gates. Uh, as far as the market is concerned, uh, we have um, we have uh, analyzed and we have envisaged various uh, business models. Um, uh, and we have um, actually uh, tested them with our uh, target stakeholders in uh, five countries. Um, however, uh, what's proven to be uh, the most effective uh, based on the feedback we receive uh, is that um, the, 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 the approach, uh, the most likely approach to be taken is uh, the white label approach. Um, and uh, actually, um, one of the major results is that two thirds of users that have actually tested the game through two validation cycles have actually expressed willingness to pay uh, for the product. Um, we are currently uh, uh, moving towards the third uh, validation cycle and the final uh, reshaping the product. Um, and uh, the, the actual strategic partnerships and early adopters program uh, will start uh, at the mid of the next year. And I here invite you uh, to take a sneak peek and to join um, our um, uh, third validation cycle as this is the unique opportunity to be for you to be the part of the um, uh, smart farming um, uh, ecosystem. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Maya. Round of applause. Well done. <laughs> Jury, the floor is all yours for questions for Maya. Uh, you don't have any sensor, so it's all the user putting the information in the... Can you please repeat? Do you have any sensors? No, it, the it user, is no. no. Uh, um, the idea behind Gates is that it's uh, applicable to any kind of technology. So we support various agricultural operations from irrigation to uh, farm monitoring, uh, farm management, 
So uh, any technology provider can come to us, you can come to them, you can discuss, we can uh, put their technology and farmers can test in, uh, in, in the platform uh, how this technology works. Uh, and easily test. integrated with other technologies that are actually doing fields? Uh, yes, so basically we support uh, the most important agricultural operations um, and uh, basically any technology can be uh, tested through, through this. And your pricing? What is uh, the pricing uh, will be is yet to be defined um, uh, as we are as we are moving out uh, to the uh, third uh, minimum viable game. So uh, during the first half of the next year, we will have uh, this uh, the, the final business model and a concrete um, concrete pricing strategy. Do you plan actually to sell this to like some end users, or is it the companies that would? There want there to have mm -hmm. their technology included in there the game. Is a, there is a difference between who is the end user here and who is actual paying customer. Uh, mm -hmm. We target both because the gate is uh, actually um, oriented uh, for, for brings value to, to, to both uh, to both stakeholders. S uh, so you to actually try to sort of promote some technologies of some companies that are developing something uh, and our, our promote it through the our paying customers uh, are most likely to be smart farming technology providers, so big industry players uh, with which we are uh, aiming to uh, form strategic partnerships. Uh, and as I said, uh, the most likely approach will be by play brand because of the shared risk and shared reward uh, in that, that is uh, underlying in, in, in this approach. So it's for farmers for learning. To okay. So I'm just thinking loud, so it's it's for farmers to learn new techniques yes. to, to plan. Uh, and now the question is that what is kind of the pedagogical uh, innovation here? Why is this, why wouldn't I uh, run such content in some other platform? Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that in some platform, uh, this is too big and expensive to build, especially if you take into account uh, the approach that we take, uh, that uh, this comprises a complex um, uh, agricultural model that has been placed into the platform by, by our partners from uh, the Agricultural University of Athens. So there is uh, con concretic, uh, here you concretic uh, knowledge uh, that has been placed into the platform. Here you have algorith algorithms that support uh, technologies to be actually applied on the platform and to work. Um, and um, um, fa for a smart farming company, whether it is a startup or an SME or um, uh, a bigger player, it's very difficult for them uh, to gather, uh, to, to, to include uh, the scientific expertise, um, the, the feedback from the end users, um, uh, and to deliver it uh, in, in their own environment. So this is why uh, the white label approach is most, most likely to be taken by by. Any more questions from the jury? No, no more questions. Round of applause one more time for Maya from Innocence in Serbia. Perfect, great. Oh, yeah, mine. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now to, uh, could we have multi-wave technologies from Switzerland? The floor is all yours, gentlemen. Oh, this looks innovative. There's two coming up. Yeah. <laughs> it's still three minutes. It doesn't become six minutes, okay? <laughs> I did. You, you got your time over there. Yeah, Three right. minutes. Okay, guys. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're right. Can you tell me how this works again? <laughs> it should. This should go forward. Okay. And this should go backwards. Okay. Great. Okay. And just stay in front of the microphones. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're two here today. Welcome. Good morning. Good evening. Uh, we are brothers. Uh, I'm Panos, and this is Triffin. Uh, we co-founded Multiwave Technologies uh, in 2015. We're based in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And we have an office in Marseille in France where we collaborate with our esteemed partners from the project M-Cube also. Um, our vision is to create um, metamaterial technologies, wow. innovations that will help improve patient care. Uh, and we're developing technologies in the field of MRI, as you've heard before, and we'll cover those uh, for you today, both the problems and the solutions. So um, I'm picking up uh, from uh, where it was left by our collaborators of Institute Fresnel. The natural evolution of MRI imaging is going to higher, stronger magnetic fields. So we were in pretest line in the year 2000. 
And today we're, for a year now, we've been in seven Tesla, which uh, improves, as was pointed out, imaging of, of the brain, uh, predominantly and especially neuroimaging. You can see two different images of three Tesla and seven Tesla on the top left. So it increases contrast and signal to noise ratio, which is great for, for, for earlier uh, di di diagnosis of disease. But there's the issues that appear as we grow in magnetic field due to the destructive interference of waves of the RF field. And uh, what, what ma mainly for the head, the, those problems occur in the temporal lobes and the cerebellum. And of course, these also problems also occur in three Tesla, so which is a bigger market that we will talk about uh, for the abdomen, the heart, and, uh, and the spine imaging. So yeah. uh, I'll give you a few, um, a little information about the MRI market. Um, some was mentioned before. Uh, there are about 50,000 scanners, 10 of which are in the three Tesla market. But here I'd like you to focus on uh, two trends. Um, look at the uh, top in green and look at the brown. Uh, these are declining trends. This is the market for 1.5 Tesla and below. This is the majority of scanners today. Um, and then you look at the yellow one and the red one, and this is the three Tesla market and this is the seven Tesla market. It's just emerging now. Um, uh, Interesting point to note that the first seven Tesla market in the, in the clinical uh, use was in Mayo Clinic last year and Siemens is the only producer with FDA and C marking uh, for it. So we have two solutions for these issues in seven Tesla. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one solution is uh, a MRI pads, which is this pouch filled with an aqueous solution of uh, ceramics, kind of metallic powders with some special water. And this is used uh, exactly how you see it in this picture to, uh, to enhance the field in the temporal lobes and the cerebellum so that we get uh, those dark spots that were mentioned before. They're not dark anymore. And we have a, a clear, diagnostically relevant image. This is uh, just to show how this works. Uh, so the top row is without pads and the bottom row is with pads. And you can see clearly that the image is uh, diagnostically relevant. Um, we, we sold the pads to the following institutes uh, in, uh, in the U.S. and Europe, uh, and this is, this is a, a market of 130 million a year. This pad, very important, is, is, uh, has a one-year shelf time, so it's renewable. Uh, every year, people have, hospitals have to buy more to use it, um, and we're in the process. It's a medical one, class one device, so it's very quick to commercialization, uh, and we're marketing it uh, in the first uh, quarter of 2019, as in the clinical uh, sense. Well, the, the second solution that was presented by our colleagues earlier, it's a uh, metamaterial structuration that would be embedded inside the head coil for the seven Tesla, which would solve the same problems as the pad, but it would be de dedicated for the seven Tesla clinical for the head. Okay. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay. Round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. Jury, over to you. <coughs> so what's your price point for the pet? Excuse me? Excuse price me? Point. What oh. is your price for the pet? So the, the pet for uh, seven Tesla is around 3,000, and the pet for three Tesla is 4,000 euros. And are there any competitors doing other meta materials? There is a meta materials, no. That, that, that's a pretty clean market. The only existing pad today that is used by GE is a water-based pad which is uh, of uh, permittivity, it's water-based, so permittivity is water, which makes it similar to the human tissue, so the enhancement of the field is not, does not make it diagnostically relevant. So it's, uh, it's safe, there's no competitors. And how many seven Teslas are out there right now? So our market, our focus market is gonna be the three Tesla market to start with. There's about 100 um, or so seven Tesla in the world today, and next, by the next three years, it's gonna be around 300. That's the estimate. Uh, whereas a 3T market, there's 10,000 scanners in the world. So that's the market growing, we're gonna target growing and growing 7%. Uh, and it's precisely for imaging of abdomen uh, and the spine and the heart. Is this a single nerve or uh, how many times can we use this? Oh, this is used uh, for a year. You can use it for a year. This, this is a mix of, uh, of, of, uh, of materials and the mix has to remain homogeneous for it to be efficient. And with time, of course, this kind of becomes inhomogeneous. It's a separation of materials. So this, the safety that should be imposed is one year use. So every year they have to renew. 
Okay, and your business model, are you partnering with the, the Siemens and the, the likes or, or are you We're selling directly? We're partnering with distributors uh, to sell. We've identified some distributors in Europe who start marketing the, 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 uh, the pad in 2019. We're also working with some distributors in China for the Chinese market because that's only the Chinese market is 1,300 3T scanners. Um, so that's, uh, and that's renewable every year. Uh, and then also in the US. And there's of course the meta material that we will be commercializing through the OEMs. And as we go into China, the IP or? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a big issue. Yeah. No, we keep the IP here. Everything will be manufactured in our, in our facility in France, in Marseille, uh, and it will be shipped uh, only. So it won't be manufactured And reverse there. engineering, is it easy? Mm, that's very complex. No, not very easy because actually a very small change in the quantity of materials used uh, and, uh, and on the size of the patch, how thick it is, then it would completely change the lensing effect and it would not make give images that are diagnostically relevant. So it's actually pretty hard. Any other use cases? I mean, out of the box. What have you been? Yes. So what have you been thinking besides be MRI? Besides MRI, this is a pad that is used. One of the applications I'm gonna you're gonna see where I'm going for the spine is to not actually enhance the field, but it's to reduce the specific absorption rate. Because it spine imaging, there's an increase of temperature because it requires more power to see the spine. So that uh, that goes above the SAR and the MRI is shuts down. What we do is we put the pad that acts as a kind of a lens of the RF field, so we can control the really the RF field take it into different places. So one potential use would be for the specific absorption rate that comes from the phones, for example, from the cell phones. That is a, that is a pretty big issue in, in, in cell phones. And so we could therefore control how the radiation is emitted in the near field from the cell phone so that we can reduce the specific absorption rate from the cell phone to the human body. Any more questions, Tatiana? No, yes? Okay, once again, thank you, Jury, and thank you very much. Multiway from Switzerland. <laughs> Okay, and if we could have, please, from Italy, Spazio Dati, the floor is yours. Um, okay, so, perfect. Okay, so, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Javier Paniagua, and I would like to start uh, with a question. What do you need to know about a company that you want to do business with? Um, the answer may seem uh, very obvious, but also very true. It's as much as possible, right? So it's a good thing that we now have a TOCA and a TOCA helps you um, get to know everything that there is to know about a company. I will use uh, the example of my fellow finalists, uh, Energica Motor, that uh, it's a pity that they are not here, but uh, we are still gonna use them as an example. This is a screenshot of uh, a TOCA and what a TOCA knows about this company. I'm not gonna go through everything, of course. I'm just gonna concentrate on bits uh, here and there. Um, Yes, in Atoka you have uh, information that comes from the business uh, registers. Uh, Atoka also goes uh, through information that is contained on, on uh, websites that are maintained by the company itself. Um, Atoka is able to build a stream of news articles uh, which mention the company. And finally, uh, we have here four examples of uh, company metric. This is a way of uh, describe the performance of the company. He, you see here uh, four metrics, and in all four cases, uh, Energica Motor gets uh, top marks. So this uh, makes for a very very compelling uh, company profile. Um, Atoka integrates uh, information from several sources. Um, of course, you get uh, whatever comes in the business registers, but there is so much more. Um, we uh, process information about uh, 14.6 million companies in Italy, the UK, Russia, and uh, soon also Norway. We go through uh, uh, approximately 1 billion different internet points to build this uh, big graph of company information and process uh, daily around 200,000 news items uh, using the latest uh, machine learning techniques to um, understand what they are talking about. We are the leading business information provider in Italy, and as such, we got to work with uh, several companies in uh, the industrial, financial, telco, media, and public sector. Um, and it's been um, a hell of a ride, let's say. 
Um, but now we are growing very fast and we will uh, finish this year with the revenue figures uh, nearing for, uh, for a million euro. Um, and this is only just in the Italian market. So the next uh, question is, uh, where do we go from here? So of course we are gonna keep pushing our in, uh, innovation forward uh, with uh, more sources and better sources, uh, but now uh, it's the time to try and make the leap beyond uh, the borders of Italy. Um, so Atoka is uh, brought to you by a team of, uh, very small team, but still very young, uh, a team of uh, people working in Italy in uh, two locations, Trento and Pisa. Um, with uh, more than five years of expertise in uh, all things big data. Um, I would like to tell you a lot more things, but uh, unfortunately time's up, so um, come take a look and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Bravo. Jury, over to you. Um, how do you actually get the data? You said it's business register, corporate rep, uh, Sorry, the, the do first. You do, do you use like the natural language processing for? Um, so there the is a, there are two parts of it. Uh, there is the structured data. This is usually very easy, of course. And but there is also this unstructured data. And yes, we use uh, natural language processing to um, maybe detect some entities and connect uh, informa our information sources. And you said that you're in three jurisdictions right now, so you're also doing this in different languages. So oh, sorry, I did. Is the technology now developed for to, to identify this in three different languages, you said now? Or uh, yeah, so but, well, it's uh, Italian and a lot of Italian, a lot of English, and uh, we are also starting with Russia. We just, uh, there's just a year uh, that we are in Russia too and uh, the next year in Norway. But in Norway, we, of course, we will start with uh, English language, since it's also very pervasive there. Um, so yes, it, it's not an easy, easy thing to uh, reapply the natural language processing techniques to a new language, but we are doing it. Okay, of course, as an, as an investor looking for deal flow, so we need all the information available, but at least we have quite many databases already, so uh, to understand what you actually are doing, so can you name a couple of competitors? Okay, so uh, for example, down on Brad Street or um, uh, this uh, Bureau of Fun, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, Van, Dyke. Van Dyke, right, you're right. Um, yes, and they are uh, doing uh, kind of similar thing, things that, uh, to, to uh, what we are doing, but they are uh, uh, concentrating heavily more on the, on the uh, let's say, on the more static aspects of uh, the life cycle of a company. And we try to uh, put our emphasis much more on the dynamic aspects, uh, these uh, new streams that we build automatically, um, trying to, uh, let's say, uh, make the users focus on particular uh, types of uh, news uh, articles. Um, this is something that we are doing um, that they are not doing or that they are uh, that we are doing also but a fraction of uh, the cost that they are doing so. so you have news data and financial data are you also looking to get scientific data like patents or other um, such sources yes this is a very interesting uh, information source for us of course this is a um, the more uh, data you have, the more opportunities you have to link more data to your data. So it's like a virtuous cycle, right? Um, uh, for example, we have, a, not, not all, all of the data that we work with is uh, public. We also have companies come with their own data. Um, let's say past performance and uh, performances selling uh, their products to um, their clients. And they want us, for example, to be the model that can predict uh, which are the companies that are more likely to um, buy this or that uh, product offering that they have now. So. And you said companies are coming to you to upload the, their own data? Um, uh, so yes, we have uh, prepared our product in a way that it's um, easier, not super easy, but easier to um, get uh, uh, data from companies, identify these uh, uh, data bits, First, uh, just the type of the data, but then uh, a, a, a level of semantics on top to understand what is the data about and integrate it in our graph. This maybe to use just uh, simply as uh, an aggregated form for, for them to browse, but also to build models for very specific things. And what, what did you say were the next markets that you wanted to go into? 
We're in Italy. Uh, yeah, so um, we are operating only in Italy. We have information of, on, on UK companies and uh, uh, companies in Russia and uh, soon in Norway, but we are only uh, operating in Italy. Um, so the next step is to actually launch our services also uh, abroad. Of course, the first markets will be um, uh, UK, Russia, and Norway. And you said you are approaching one million in sales, I think? Um, uh, for the four million in revenue, yeah. yes. And um, is that using this technology or is this some other services that you're doing as well? Well, it's, uh, this is uh, the biggest part of uh, our offering. Uh, uh, we started first, w first with just the semantic tools and we use these tools to build this product now. So there is a part of our business that, that is still directly attached to just using the semantic tools, but uh, the bigger part is this one. Uh, I don't know if you can disclose, but I'm curious about your, your customer. Uh, is, are you targeting this more toward the financial institutions or who are your preferred clients? I think well, uh, our preferred clients of uh, bigger clients because um, the business part of it is very usually uh, juicier, right? Um, um, now we are, so we started uh, with um, a talk offered uh, online as a way to um, um, uh, let people browse for company information. But then we um, got a lot of business also from these uh, specific uh, integrations or, or specializations of Atoka to answer very specific questions like a model that predicts sales. Uh, so yes, it's uh, a big part of it is uh, lead generation in, in, in the broader sense, but also very specific types of lead generation. And this is the, this, uh, we have been able to repeat uh, several times with different clients. This is very quick one. So just uh, what do, how do you do on sustainability? Do you, do, do, do you gather data of the companies, how they are doing against the uh, United Nations uh, sustainability goals 2030, or do you have anything about corporate social responsibility or, or sustainability? Sorry, do, do you want me to talk about a particular case? Uh, yeah. No, no, just in general, that all of these companies that you follow, so do you also follow their, their ecological footprint or sustainability? Uh, domain of any sort or, or how do they report uh, against the United Nations 2030? Um, well, I don't uh, know about the specific cases that relate uh, to this. Uh, okay, so then you don't do that. Thanks. Yeah, but um, and last we quick could. Question. <laughs> we are not pricing, close to the option. <laughs> do you do like a monthly price or do you do a data consumption price? Yeah, so do, do you, I like what, sorry? The pricing, is it like a monthly fixed price or is it a uh, so go, it like how much data you can right um, it depends uh, on the <coughs> on the model of course we, we don't uh, work just with one there is the online version which we you have several access tiers and uh, you get either um, more seats uh, per, per um, customer or uh, or you get uh, deeper levels of access to more data or less data so we are able to play with the price uh, that way and then there are the customizations that uh, this is a case by case uh, basis. Okay, and the, the average price just for one seat? Oh, well, um, the, the basic tier is uh, around 400 uh, euro a month. Do you buy hard, do you know by hard, uh, customer acquisition cost and uh, customer lifetime uh, value? Uh, I, I don't have those figures here. So okay. Sorry. Okay, but that you know that the VCs are always asking CACs. Yes, and and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions, jury? You got what you need? Excellent. One last round of applause, please, for Spazio Dati in Italy. Okay, that brings us to a close in terms of the best young SME category. Before we close this half of the pitching, we're going to have two more pitches. The first two from the uh, um, best early stage innovation category. We've got the f two, and at the, at, the, at the end of that second one, we will have a break for a 20 minutes, grab a coffee, uh, et cetera, and then come back at four o'clock where we will resume with the other two finalists in the best early stage innovation, and then we'll finish up with the last two categories. So ladies and gentlemen, to get things kicked off for the best early stage innovation category, could I have Bio Inicia from Spain to the floor? And we pull up the slides, please, for Bio Inicia. Thank you. Thank you. Are you having your can, can you help me out here? How does it work? Let's check it works. Hang on. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Wait. 
So there we go. Red is bad words. Huh? Red back, green forwards, and your clock, two minutes. You're starting off again. Very good. So thank you very much. It is my pleasure to be here today. So my name is Chema, and I'm here representing Bionicia innovation that was developed within a European project called Octinano Pro. So actually what we have developed is a super hydrophobic uh, and oleophobic uh, biocoding that can be applied either on films or also in 3D shaped concave surface, right? Uh, Bionicia is a company that has about two, 22 employees right now and is located in Valencia and is developing ultra thin fiber based materials and also particles in which we can control size and size distribution by using this technology called electro hydrodynamic uh, processing. So the team behind the company and actually behind the development is, is there. So I'm running the R&D department, I'm the founder of the company, but I'm running the R&D department. We actually came up with the development, the, the bio-based coding. Uh, David, who is the chief of engineering with his team, he's actually being able to scale it up and to actually build the machinery to produce it. So we actually develop the material, but also the machinery. And then we have the other three departments, which is business development, which led by, is led by Lars. Uh, who is actually gathering uh, customers for our technologies. Uh, Polly, who is finding raising, uh, uh, fundraising uh, stuff. And Jose Manuel, who is doing the manufacturing and building the factories as well, because we produce everything uh, at home at the moment. So the problem is the adhesion of some uh, components, foods, uh, uh, healthcare products, cosmetics, etc., over surfaces. And, and this is uh, one of the things, uh, as well as dirt, and this is one of the things that we wanted to tackle. So we, within the activities that in which we focus our development, initially was the uh, applications for promoting easy emptying in packaging, so that you don't really need to squeeze any more your bottles or your films because the material would just slide easily, right? And then there were another application for self-cleaning, in solar panels, we are still working in here because it's a little bit more complicated. In any case, we, uh, the, the uh, packaging field, especially the flexible packaging, is a huge business. It's about 80 billion uh, revenue business, uh, and there is a lot of, uh, with, with 5, 4.5% annual growth, and this growth, and also keeping the activities of uh, this uh, business is a lot depending on innovation, on this rapid innovation, right? So our technology is able to then reduce waste by, by avoiding that these pasty uh, foods, for instance, or healthcare products remain in the packaging. And, uh, and as a result of that, and due to the big revolution that we are currently undergoing in the packaging industry, where everything is to be now recyclable or biodegradable, then we are also able to, this is going to zero now. It's gone to zero. It's three minutes? Or three minutes. Oh my. <laughs> okay, so. So uh, basically what we have done then is develop this application where we actually work and, and apply these codings over, as I said, films or uh, different uh, concave objects. This is patented. We patented the technology, but also the machinery. We have three patents for the machinery in addition for the technology. Our achievement so far is development the bio-based coding, achieve a successful route to generate that vision which is what was missing for some of the existing technologies, being able to develop the engineering to code flat and 3D surfaces, which is also a big challenge when you use high electric fields, uh, patenting the technology, producing the press proof of concept machinery that was put online in a factory, and successful testing of films, shoulders, and tubing at the company site. Our future plans are to optimize the solution in terms of a number of issues that are described there, the creation of a subsidiary that will take care of uh, commercialization of this uh, project and eventually install a pilot, a pilot plant uh, with an industrial partner and, uh, and further, further after industrial plants all over the world. Thank you for your attention. Well done, thank you. So, Jury, questions for Bioinitia from you. I went, it goes fast. <laughs> I need to check on you. I should have checked. So, how far are you with sales? Do you have starting customers? Yeah, so we have one retailer that is really interested and one of the major film suppliers that is 
with whom we are considering to do a joint venture. I mean, there is the issue of exclusivity, and then our Lars, our business development guy, is trying to limit that to two years, et cetera. But, but we are really interested in working with people in the field because in the end, they will know how to better optimize our product to reach uh, their, uh, their customers, in fact. How much more expensive will the packaging be if you apply your code? Yeah, so the cost that we have calculated just of the process is about zero, uh, so it's two cents of an euro per square meter. So uh, the typical packaging would be maybe increased by about three, four percent, the actual cost. But if you bear in mind that this technology, as opposed to another one that exists from a Japanese company, is able to, on top of having this super hydrophobic, this water and oil repellent surface, be able to incorporate within this barrier uh, properties and also active components like the antimicrobial, oxygen scavengers, gives you, let's say, a platform to modify not only the surface, but also the packaging, uh, the properties of the packaging as a whole. What else do you need to do to get this into the market? Are there regulations, requirements, tests? We are complying with the regulations. Uh, as, as I said, within the project, we develop a bio-based solution that is completely biodegradable in the environment. So if the packaging ends up in the sea or in the garden, it will biodegrade at least the coating part. Depending on whether the packaging is also made of biodegradable material, the whole thing will be bio-based and biodegradable. Uh, and the question was? Are you allowed allowed to already use your yeah. coating? So all the additives in there are complying with the food contact uh, list. And this is, that was monitored by a partner that was in the project that was, you know, making sure that we were using only food contact permitted substances. We are right now testing the migration in different substrates because the adhesion requires a post-processing step. And by, by doing this post-processing, uh, we are, you know, we are getting higher let's say repellent properties, but at the same time, we may promote a little bit of migration. So we need to balance all of this. But in principle, the migration is currently being tested and we comply with the global migration limits and the specific migration limits as well. Any more questions? Yes, uh, Teresa. Quick question, are you focusing more on the food industry or the, the uh, energy? Yeah. We, we, we go for the food industry because it's a huge market. We are very cheap to manufacture, we can control everything because we have the technology and also we build the machinery. And this is the, it's a huge market. It's just, uh, I don't know, just flexible packaging in Europe is about four million tons a year of product that is being used to produce packaging. So all of this surface could be eventually accessible to apply to our technology. And it can be used with liquids as well, as a packaging for liquids? Sure, yeah, yeah, it is for liquids, yeah. We had, uh, I, I didn't have the, maybe if you see here the picture, this is uh, some of the companies that was in the consortium actually build the tubes, they put their conventional cosmetic and other products, and then you can see the difference between easy sliding and not sliding. So liquids are, of course, uh, supposed to be in there. I'll just, my remark, but not, well, it's quite competitive landscape nowadays. I mean, like five years ago, yes, but now, I mean, I think like uh, they're, they're everybody everybody tries to, you know, conquer the, the, the pain of plastic. Uh, so I, basically, how do you see the landscape? Why would you, how do you differ from the existing technologies that are basically claiming the same? <laughs> well, you? Uh, as far as we know, there is only one company in Japan that claims to have a technology that works like this, in which they coat with a liquid. Of course, this is not recyclable, uh, uh, whereas in our case, we can do either, big, we can make our packaging compliant with recyclable and also with biodegradable, uh, with biodegradability. And, and therefore, we can use the same material that is being used in the packaging, or we can use a different one uh, that is maybe bio-based or, or not. So we have the full flexibility on that. Uh, it is true that this technology is relatively well known for coating uh, glass, uh, but in glass there is a kind of silanization, so there is a reaction, and this cannot be applied to packaging. In fact, it was very difficult to really develop a technology that, that could be complying with the legislation in packaging, and that could additionally add these this other features like barrier properties or uh, antioxidant, oxygen scavenging technologies within the same coating because it's based on a, on a system that is being spun from a liquid. Within this liquid, we can incorporate other elements and they, they end up in the coating. 
So um, I think the, uh, well, you know, the packaging industry has a lot of interest and we're just seeing that. Uh, and also the retailers, because they, in the end now we need to find ways to sell packaging, right? Uh, because it's all, all in the media that uh, packaging has a lot of negative implications. We, with our coding, can uh, either build this into, co into conventional packaging, but also uh, into the new biodegradable or bio-based packaging. You mentioned you're looking for investors. How long away are you from becoming profitable? Or how much investment are you looking for? Uh, well, we need one and a half million euros to build, a, uh, let's say, a complete demonstration plan with a film line and uh, attaching our technology to this uh, thin line because it actually runs in continuous. So we built it during the project. We brought the equipment to the factory of one of uh, the customers that is making this flat sheet to eventually make tubes. And we apply that in line in the process. So, uh, so eventually this will be implemented most likely within the industry, uh, so you've within the current process. You've proven it in the lab. Now you just need to scale it up. Yeah, we did it also on the pilot scale because the equipment that we built for the project was a pilot scale. We were actually having a roll-to-roll -roll system where film from the industry was actually being coded. Uh, but uh, yeah, eventually it has to be brought into industry. This technology has never been used at such a high scale. So it's called, it is what we call the super uh, throughput because cur currently we have the highest throughput available in the market for other applications for pharma and biomedical devices. This is where we live out now. Uh, but we already built the only one plant in the world that is GMP certified to produce uh, this product uh, to get patches, etc., for pharma and biomedicine. Last question, quickly. Quick one. The film you have is also for the solar panels or, or is it? Yeah, the, the for, for solar panels works very well in, in plastic solar panels, right? The all. only problem is that we, uh, they, they require full transparency. Exactly. So we are losing a little bit of transparency and this is actually losing a little bit of efficiency. We need to optimize the thickness and the dispersion, let's say, of the, uh, of the components involved. Uh, so we see that as a second stage uh, and then we, uh, the companies that were involved, they did not really show that much interest as the packaging industry has shown so far. And we do not plan to take that internally ourselves because we are focusing in the biospace, in other applications, but this is what we call super high throughput. And uh, the industry then, we want to team up with the industry there. Very good. Thank you very much, Bionicia. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. And now, uh, for the second uh, pitch, could I have Sintef from Norway? Is it you? It is you. I, 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 I didn't see you move. Sorry, it is you. Sintef from Norway. Okay. Very good. Come on over. Uh, this is going to be the last of this session before the break, but after 20 minutes after, come back in, and we will continue with the last of the pitches. Uh, to, yeah, the last of the pitches. So, please, the floor is all yours, and you have three minutes on the clock. Thank all right. You. And you're showing the oh, excuse me. Yeah, green to go forward, red to go back. Okay, and, and your slides are already up. And there. Don't worry about the other. Uh, uh, laser. Let's check. No, pointer. we'll do something a little bit. There is, I think, yes, great, thank you. Uh, yes, you have a laser. I didn't know that. Wow. Good technology. Okay. There you go. There's your laser. Right? All right. All right. I think it's... And uh, let's check the slides out together, working over here. Oh. Got your clock, yeah? Thank you. Wow. Happy moment. This is myself, a few months ago, yeah. with my nephew, Mario. Mario and every kid born in 2018 will need 1.4 kilotons of raw materials through their lifetime. Industrialization and also easy access of modern technologies together with the continuous increase in world population is making that uh, we are needing huge amounts of raw materials. Some of these raw materials are considered critical like the platinum group uh, metals. The platinum group metals, PGMs, can be used in many different applications from fertilized production to medicines against cancer, uh, fiberglass optics, and uh, powerful computers to the digitalization era. Also in environmental technologies like uh, fuel cell vehicles and also uh, automobile catalysts. The PGM demand in the world is con constantly increasing during the years and so their prices. 
So there is a gap today between the supply and the demand, and this gap can be filled by increasing the recycling activities. Uh, regaining PGMs from waste streams uh, is a good opportunity to facilitate uh, their availability and also the security of their supply by mainly three reasons. Because um, yeah, the mining producers are usually uh, from um, unstable countries like uh, South Africa or Russia, China. Also because there is a higher content of PGMs in the wastes compared to the ores. And because also the third one is that um, yearly the waste containing PGMs are increasing and especially is the case of the waste from electronic and electric equipment. There is another big uh, reason is because also recycling um, means 10 to 20 times uh, reducing in um, um, CO2 emissions. So existing technologies today uh, are quite energy intensive and requires high capital investment cost, which makes centralized layout and then SMEs scale um, uh, activities are completely ruled out. And those are the ones that can maximize the exploitation of uh, local uh, waste streams. So our innovation will give a breakthrough in the PGM extraction technologies by providing a method which combines extraction and recovery in one single step. So it's much more simple, it has a low cost, and it's working at lower operating temperature. And foremost, it can be replicated to any other uh, raw materials and value chains as well. This is an early stage innovation, so there is some uh, time until commercialization, I have to say. The principle is validated in the frame of the project uh, that um, this is uh, belonging to. So what we see as the roadmap is, uh, first of all, process design engineering and optimization before going to a validation in the pilot scale to gain the necessary data regarding energy efficiency, material yields, uh, environmental footprint to do good business models. And then perhaps we are ready to commercialization venture. At Sinte, we are a contract research organization. Our vision is technology for a better society. We have been taking our innovations to the market before, either through spin-offs supported by Sinte FTT office or by giving the technology license to one of or some of our 4,000 customers all over the world. So we can succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Sinte. <laughs> Jury, Sintef. Over uh, to you, Jury. What's the yield of a percent of uh, raw material? Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah. As I said, we have just demonstrated the technology with one type of waste, which is the automobile catalysts. So what we got, it's 65% of yield in our laboratory cell. So of course, it's far from being uh, optimized. And what's the scale that you've used in your lab? Today? We are using uh, 200 grams of uh, electrolyte and uh, treating 50 grams of catalyst, more or less. Two years of project, so. Sorry, I didn't get the start. So it's PGMs, platinum group metals? Platinum, palladium, iridium, rhodium, ruthenium. Very expensive metals, critical metals. And through your process, you can extract them from autocatalyst waste? Any kind of waste containing PGMs, yes. What, what happens to the waste before it goes through your process and after? Nothing. That's the beauty of our process, that it can be um, used directly without any pretreatment. And in the same process, you can extract and recover the PGMs. And also, we can valorize other eventual um, valuable uh, elements. It, during in your the process, are there any additional wastes that you create? Yes, there is uh, some waste because, uh, for example, in the autocatalyst, uh, maybe you know, this is uh, mainly a coedrite. Platinum group metals, they are very expensive, so they are used in very small amounts. So in exactly in uh, autocatalyst, they are using around two weight percent maximum of PGMs. And the rest is silicon oxide, mainly aluminum oxide, magnesium oxide. So you get a slug that can be used for road uh, construction, for example. There are also other um, valuable elements, and we can, with our process, also valorize them, like rare earths. 
what is the ecological footprint of this particular process? Yeah, uh, we don't have so much data about it, but we have a quite close loop uh, recycling. So we are using all the wastes, as I said, and able to valorize them as well. But, um, okay, this is a laboratory scale, so I think the data will be a little bit uh, approximate to further business cases. We need to go a little bit uh, in a larger scale. Uh, what, what is the idea to have a pilot uh, recover, uh, recycling unit by the automotive industry or you have to just transport the raw materials or have you done any assessment on the, the costs or? Oh, you mean to transport the waste? Uh, I mean either that or if you, I don't know what's the cost of the recycling unit or you have the recycling unit close to the, to the automotive industry, so that's what I'm asking. Yeah, well uh, usually um, uh, recycling of PGMs are very en energy intensive and it needs a high in investment costs. So only big giants like Umicor or uh, yeah, Johnson Muffy can do it or other big companies like Glencore that has uh, PGMs out of as byproduct of their, of their um, activities. So if you have a technology that is much cheaper, you are given the chance to SMEs that has not uh, such a, a large investment uh, capabilities to uh, start up this uh, recycling uh, opportunity, more in a local place, yes, so then you avoid to having all this waste transport and so on. In the project that this uh, technology has been developed, two years, I repeat, we have been working on this two years only. There are also big stakeholders, uh, Johnson Mathy, and also there are SMEs, there is one automobile catalyst uh, uh, collecting and uh, recycling company, Monolithos, in Greece. So they could be interested in exploring this technology. As I said, we need to investigate more to give more data and good business cases to SMEs. Or and, and what is your plan as next steps? How do you want to commercialize it? Mm. We have uh, still two more years in the project, so we are still um, trying to at least go into Perhaps in two years we can reach further optimization and engineering, perhaps. And then, of course, we have to continue either with national um, uh, instruments in Norway, Innovation Norway, or the Research Council of Norway, or even going further with another EU finance project towards uh, demonstration. Uh, Platyrus project is a area project is research and innovation action much lower tier, ele uh, tier level, so perhaps having another joint venture in your Europe uh, could also be the way. And then perhaps after that, a four years project, we can have some data on the pilot scale prototype activities to give good business cases. Okay, currently, you said that currently only the big companies can actually afford I to... Currently, only the big companies can afford um, the tech to use the technology that actually allows the extraction because it's capital intensive and expensive, right? So, does the majority of these materials now just does not get recycled, or what? Uh, um, if you talk about uh, automobile catalyst, yes, there is recycling of automobile catalyst per today. Uh, so what you're doing is actually making it cheaper and allowing other yeah. companies to get in. Uh, other business opportunities to SMEs, for example, yes. Yeah. Uh, and you also about so you mentioned your yield, recovery yield for the automobile catalyst is 65%. So what's the compared? I think they have a much higher yields. I mean, they have been doing this for <laughs> many years. They are industrial so already. The advantage of your, so they have higher yields than you have, than your process. In, in, my, in my lab, in the lab, oh, we yeah. have got 65% yield in the lab. In the lab. Which I think is quite good. So but we are aiming for higher yields, of course, even, because yeah. even if it is a simpler process with lower yields, it doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, but you have a figure for the what's currently, what's the figure now? I think they are reaching quite the high yields on 80, 90 percent. Uh, mm. I think they are quite happy with that, uh, yes. 90 percent Johnson Murphy, I think. So I, I don't, I don't, so what's your competitive advantage because you're... It's much simpler process. It's very energy intensive. It has many steps for them, okay. yes. Okay. And this is using the waste directly to one single reactor, extracting and recovering. Whereas uh, today's uh, process, it has many leaching steps. 
uh, much more hazardous wastes, if you want to say. C can you um, explain a little bit further? So what do you do and what do they do? It's a different concept. It's a different technology. What they do is based, uh, usually a state of art, um, they are having two approaches uh, in the same process. First of all, it's a pyrometallurgical process. They burn up everything at 1500 degrees to try to uh, concentrate the PGMs in the metal phase. Then they get this metal phase and then uh, have hydrometallurgical steps, many hydrometallurgical steps, separation steps. So we combine it all in one, around 500 degrees. So that's a great advantage. And you're still heating it up and then splitting it and taking it out? Selective separation, yes. Thank you. Okay, one more quick question. None? Are we jury happy with? You've got your po excellent. Listen, could I have a round of applause one more time for Anna Maria from Sintef in Norway? Okay. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, that's the end of it for this part. In 20 minutes, we're going to start again with the second and last round of pitches for the Radar Prize. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to the pitchers. See you in 20 minutes. Thank you.